Welcome to the Elevating La Cultura podcast, a space where I talk with Latinas who are passionate about what they do and are willing to share that passion with others to change the narrative, especially for the next generation. Each season is centered around different topics, but all with a Latina perspective. Welcome to season eight, where we will talk all things corporate and higher education. I'm so excited to share these powerful stories. So vamonos, and let's get into it. Hola, today I'm talking with Estrella, a first-gen Latina community leader who has established a community of over 87K plus students and postgrads through her work as a content creator, college and postgrad coach, and podcast host of Cafecito con Estrellita. Estrella's career started in the social media industry in 2019, stemming from her passion for higher education attainment for Latinas and conducting undergraduate qualitative research. Her dedication to uplifting and educating her community earned her a TEDx talk and the opportunity to work with big name brands such as McDonald's, Amazon, and Me Too for educational campaigns and projects. She also served as a memorable speaker throughout the years for school-wide events at Harvard, University of Notre Dame, California State University, and Channel Islands to thousands of first-generation Latinx and Hispanic students. Enjoy our conversation. Hi, I'm here today with Estrella, a fellow podcaster that I have been following and listening to for a while, and I'm so excited to get into this conversation and share her area of expertise. Uh, Quick shout out to Ashley, who uh, got us together and got us looped in so that we could actually meet in person. I feel like I've been following you on social media for a while, and so I feel like I know you, but... um, I'm thankful that we can actually meet in person. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? No, of course. And before I introduce, I'm just, again, very grateful that you opened up your podcast space for me. I'm so excited for this episode. And again, shout out to Ashley for connecting us. So yes, my name is Estrella. I am the podcast host, creator, all that fun stuff that goes under entrepreneurship of Cafecito con Estrellita, a Latinx podcast that guides first generation scholars through higher education paths and postgrads. And I've been doing my line of work specifically in social media professionally for the last three years, but because I've always been super involved in school and I always love connecting with people, even when I had no idea how to use social media, I would like to say I've been doing the academia community building for a lot longer than that. And again, I'm just so excited to be here. Yeah, I think for anyone who listens to your podcast, And for new listeners that you'll get through this episode, I just love how you break it down and you're so relatable. Like, I feel like I am literally sitting down over a cup of coffee or some tea and just like listening into the ups and downs of education, your life, like all the things. So I really appreciate your vulnerability and you sharing, because I think this is an important conversation and an important space, especially for first gen Latinas who are finding themselves in a world that is kind of um, new. I think I've, I've talked to a lot of other first gen Latinas who are entering the educational space and feel like it's kind of a culture shock because it is so uh, white dominant and it's it's a different way of life than we're used to. And so I'd love to know what brought you to this space and what brought you to wanting to share your experience with other people. No, of course. And I really appreciate that question. And thank you so much for everything you just said. Now, the way that I found myself specifically on social media, let's take it back to community college. So I had just graduated high school and was going to enroll into a community college because I specifically remember the start of my senior year in high school. I didn't even see myself in a university like at all, but I knew I had to do something with my life because I would always hear that growing up, like, tienes que ser algo, like, your parents, they sacrifice so much. And I was very aware of that. And, you know, I loved them so much. I was just like, it was a lot of pressure 
for somebody who was getting ready to leave high school and had a lot of limiting beliefs, not just bit, not just because of like insecurities from like education, but also because of like the things I was used to seeing growing up, such as machismo, such as young girls, mujeres are only supposed to do this, which in all honesty, everybody knows this or should know this, that mujeres should always know that they have more than one option of what they can do with their life. Like that's my, one of my other biggest things I love talking about. Now, continuing forward. So high school is coming to an end and I applied to community college and I was like, okay, this is a start. I don't know how far this is going to take me, but we're going to figure it out. So I enroll and I was taking just the basic general ed. And I was also taking a couple classes where they just weren't transferable classes, but I had to do it to enhance my writing and things like that. Cause I was an ELD student for all of high school and junior high, like the enrolled in the ELD classes. And then it was actually an intro to psychology course. Uh, that was the first time I had ever seen a woman of color, a black mujer in a professional setting like that. And I was so inspired because she just looked so beautiful. She sounded so, I don't know how to describe, but just so confident and powerful. And I just remembered, wow, I want to be like that. And she's also had this humble approach, but yet like she knew how much of a boss she was. So I was like, I wanted to, you know, so one thing led to another and I would go to her office hours for regular questions, but also like just to chit chat. So I was networking before I even knew it was networking. And she had told me she had became a professor and worked on research. Her research interests were focused on something different, but moral of the story, she was able to do everything she was doing to inspire a student like me by getting her PhD and becoming a professor. And then one thing led to another. And the three years I was in community college, I was heavily involved on campus, not just like for the fun stuff, like extracurriculars and stuff, but también I started joining research clubs and one in, sp in specific, it's called Cybeta, and it's primarily focused on research and psychology. And all the professors I had there were first generation. And even though like we, they weren't Latina or Latino, just the fact that they could relate to me in that level and being able to see that they once came from hard backgrounds, not because of their fault, just because the world is so crazy and they were able to give back, I knew I wanted to do that. So essentially till this day, I strongly believe that it was that faculty, those mentors that pushed me to actually transfer to a UC because I didn't even think I was going to transfer. I just thought I was going to get the associates. So then I transferred and I was just, I was really glad I did that for myself because one, I wanted to finish my education once I started to get more into the and wanting to become a professor. But también, that's when I was starting to meet more professors that were Latina, Hispanic, and I primarily met them in my Spanish major, a couple in my global studies major. But it was just such a great experience. And I was able to continue working with them, doing a thesis, da, da, da. And then after undergrad, oh my gosh, despite all the great mentorship, at the same time, it was very, very hard for me to find them. So I'm going to take a little few steps back because when I first went into Santa Barbara, um, a predominantly white research institution, just like a lot of them are, I definitely experienced the culture shock, number one. And then number two, even though I knew I had the help and I felt confident because I had that help at community college, as soon as I stepped foot on that campus, I was like, whoa, I had to have so much help or feel like I did in community college. Am I going to get the same help when I'm at this bigger school? And if I do or don't have that help, am I going to graduate? And I just had all these questions. And then one thing led to another. I fall onto academic probation, not purposely. And I always like to emphasize that because at least for me, I didn't tell that many people that I did. But when I did, the conversations would quickly turn into like, well, what did you do wrong? Especially when I would bring it back home and share it with like my parents that had never gone to college. And of course, like they were just trying to do their best with what they knew. They like what they knew was just like 
you, if you show up and like do the work, because that's what we were used to seeing you do in K through 12 and community college, then you'll pass. So are you not doing the work? But it's like, it gets deeper than that. It's, it's not just like, am I not doing the work? It's just like the way it's getting taught, the different learning styles, the fact that the semester, the quarter system is just more intense at a transferable, like a four-year university than community college. Like community colleges are hard too, but there's always a little bit more flexibility and leeway, at least in my opinion, with what I've experienced, because primarily most of the faculty at community colleges know that their students work full-time and do other obligations outside of just school. And that was very true for me too, but it's just like once I transferred to this bigger school, this prestige, it's like they didn't care. They didn't care that I still had to pick up the phone while things were going down at home and while I'm trying to study for this final exam. They didn't care that while I was getting research participants for a study I was helping a professor with, they, they didn't care that like I had to then drive all the way back home two hours to help out with this or that. It was just a mess. But then it was very rocky because I had no mentorship. I didn't know how I was going to get out of the hole I had found myself in. Those first two quarters, I was on probation. But then that's when I did the switch with my major because I transferred in, in with psychology. But it's because I transferred in with psychology because I was still debating on a bio psych transition. It's a whole other conversation itself. But then that's when I when I was doing the switch and to majors that had faculty that looked like me, even though that's not what that's not initially what I thought I was looking for, but it was what I needed. So then I graduated and I did all this cool stuff and I was applying to the master's program, got in. And then if you've been with me for a while, you know everything else that has happened. So with that whole backstory, everything that I was sharing, the reason why I am so passionate about the work that I do so much that I committed to it full time entrepreneur is because I know what it's like to have very big dreams, to have the dreams of others behind your back, because despite everything, you do love them and you want to honor them. You want to honor yourself. You want to honor those before you, because it's so crazy to think that like my parents came from these little pueblitos via Mendoza and Aquiteramo in Michoacán to then over here in the States and go to like these big name schools like Santa Barbara, or even if it's not a big name school, just a university in itself in the US. It's such a huge thing. So with all those pressures, just like, I knew I want to do this, but how am I supposed to do it if I'm alone? I can't do it alone. It takes a village. So one day when the pandemic hit, I was just like, well, I guess I can start that podcast. I guess I can construct that village and find a way to reach as many first-gen Latine, Latinx students as I can, not just through podcast episodes, but on Instagram and TikTok and just keep showing up as much as I can while now we're here in the podcast. So I hope that answers the question. I'm sorry. I just get so passionate about this. No, that is um, very understandable and very relatable. I love to see the thread that has brought you to where you're at currently. Um, I'd love to know, or can you explain a little bit what academic probation means? No, of course. So from the best of my ability, just kidding. No, so the the way I would define academic probation is you enter into your institution, right? Whether you're a freshman or an incoming transfer. And then you get pretty much a D or an F. It could be more than one, just depending what it is. And the moment you fall under a 2.0, you are on academic probation. I know some institutions call it academic disqualification, but it just depends where you're located. And so when you fall into academic probation, I will use that term because that's what my institution used it. You are in essentially being watched by your institution where it's just like your academic record, your student record, your grades, they're, they have the label on it where you're on academic probation. You have to make sure you get your GPA above a 2.0 before the end of the following quarter or there will be more consequences. 
So then, um, because I kept, I redid like my calculus classes and all those things the following quarter when it's just like, I should have just switched it before, but you know, that, that persistence of like, no, if I just do it one more time, but sometimes it's okay just to change. Like you don't have to like hurt yourself mentally if it's like, if it's just not working out, you know? So then the second quarter came and even though I put in just as much work, maybe even a little more than the first quarter, it's still under that 2.0. So if it's under that 2.0, when you reach like that second warning, then they're like, okay, this is the last time. And if you don't get above that 2.0 or at least that 2.0, then we're going to have to give you your disqualification letter or however else they turn, they um, categorize that. And you will have to leave the university. And believe it or not, there's, I was only able to find it for community college level students, but that's also because I did it through Google Scholar. There's other research databases at the universities that you can go a lot deeper. But I, I was reading that about 35% of incoming community college students fall on academic probation. So academic probation isn't just at like, in like higher four year institutions, it also happens at the community college level. And then I was just like, whoa, if that percentage is there, I wonder how much more that percentage can be there when you're at a more, again, elite, prestigious four-year university. So I hope I explained it well. It's It can be scary. Like the word probation can be like jarring, especially if you're not used to that type of language in your education and it's especially jarring for your parents which you're trying to explain like oh no well i'm not like getting kicked out yet but this is what is happening and i know my parents would not like they'd be like like how you explained it like what is wrong with you why aren't you working hard enough why aren't you doing this it should be easy because everyone has said that it's easy and so and so has gone through it and so and so has gone through it why is it harder for you without taking into consideration that the higher education system is built for people who are going into undergrad like right after college into their four-year university and everything is kind of mapped out for them and they don't have the same lived experiences as other people of color and it's it's simpler for mm, i don't know i want to be careful with the way that i say it because like you said for a Latina family, like we have expectations that it doesn't matter if you have responsibilities or a job or like homework, like your family calls you, like you're expected to pick up. And even now, like I am an adult, my own kids married and my father calls and I will drop everything and I'll pick up that phone to see what is wrong. And that is just not the case for families that are more traditionally American and here. And it's just like hard to explain that in a way that people will understand it at the level that they're telling us like, oh, well, your academic career and your homework should be priority. When in reality, it is a priority, but so is family life. And so are all these other things like your job and, and everything, because everything needs to continue moving in order for you to keep moving forward. And other people just don't have those same obstacles. Um, you mentioned that you were going through a lot of limiting beliefs as you were entering college, like even community college. How did you navigate those? And then how did that change as you entered uh, the university? No, of course. And I really appreciate you asking me this question. Disclaimer, I'm very emotional, very sensitive. So if I start crying, it's okay. I can still, I'm still, how's the word? I'm still, I'm a person that when I cry, I can, I'm still understood. If you know what I mean, like it doesn't get too crazy. But, oh my gosh, it's so funny that you asked that too. Funny in a good way, because now that I'm 28 and I'm like in a different chapter in my life, because 
I, I talk about this a lot on socials, but I have been in academia for the last 10 years. And that's all I knew for 10 years. So as much as like, I know I tried my best with figuring out who I was as a person while in school, figuring out, I knew I tried my best, but I never ever actually gave myself like how I am now that I would say proper grace period to like really know me. And there's a part of me that's just like, dang it, I probably should have taken that gap year after my bachelor's before starting my master's at Fullerton. So then I can just like figure out more things about me because it's not always about a career. I know for like a lot of us and I'm speaking on my experience, for me, it was always like career, do this, do that, because like I grew up poor, low income. I spent the first five years of my life in Santana. I, my gosh, like even though like, you know, I, I will always have a good place in my heart for Santana, California, but you know, it's, it's not really known as like the safest, but yeah. And then we moved to Anaheim, but it was just so crazy. So anyways, let me just take a step back. So how did I navigate these limiting beliefs? And to be honest, I was just trying the best with the knowledge I knew because I was expected to get this college degree, right? And in the US education system. But while I was expected to do that, I was also expected to get good money, but make sure you eventually get married and have kids, okay? And, but when you get married and have kids too, make sure that like you don't work for too long, you don't get this much money or anything like that because the man always has to be a provider. And don't get me wrong, I love me a man that can be a provider. I feel like the husband and the wife, when they come together, they can be such a strong team, you know, because we all got, we can all work together as a team. But it's just like, at least the way it was being spoken to me was just like, it doesn't matter how much you work, Estrella, you're still a mujer and you have a timeline for how long you can be a badass career woman because you still have to like get married and things like that. And don't get me wrong. I was a girly that like my wedding, I was dreaming of that when I was five years old. I've always been a very romantic like that. Like I, I always say this once in a while when I get asked when I was in, I specifically remember first or second grade, my teacher had asked me, what career do you want when you grow up? And I said, oh, I want to be a mom with kids. And then she's like, that's not a career. I was like, but I li like, you know, so all that stuff. So as I got older, it's just like, I'm doing all these cool things like research. I'm doing like all these really cool extracurriculars. I'm getting these cool, like work experiences and stuff like that. And, but it's just like always being reminded, but don't be too much because you need to know your place as a mujer. But it's just like that probably worked during a different time. But here in this individualistic society of the U.S., it's not really it's it's not really a thing. It's very there are just so many different pathways that you can take as a mujer, whether you want to get married, whether you want to just live on your own and be the super badass career woman and build an empire. So many different avenues. And that is more than OK. But I always grew up super confused about that until the last two years because I just I would always just hear very misguided consejos especially because like I would hear that from my house but then when I would be at school and I would see like how I told you that really awesome professor in my psych one class walking in with her nice Louis Vuitton and things like that and teaching us in such an inspiring way and she lives on her own she's not married because you know she would share with us and then I'm like, where do I go? What's right for me? I don't know. And then when I would explain how these cool other mojeres were leading with their careers and their lives to like my loved ones, I don't know. I wouldn't, they would just like look at me in a way, you know, but I'm really glad. I will say this. I'm really glad that like, even though I was lost a lot, I didn't always know where I was going. I'm just glad that I never limited myself with the different options I can take because now I found myself in a position where like I'm doing what I love which is essentially being a social uh, not social media. let me rephrase that being a higher education advocate 
and running my social media business primarily with, again, advocating for higher education attainment for Latinas, first gen. But it's like I wouldn't have been able to find myself here or even have the confidence to do this full time because it's so scary. Like two weeks ago, I was crying because I had to switch banks. Like I've never had like I've had the same bank forever. But like then I had to switch because now I'm a business. And I just the best advice I can give you because it's super, super like I know how hard it is to like learn to unlearn. You're trying to do this and that just don't limit yourself take it one day at a time if something interests you try it out if you can and just take it day by day because you never know where you're going to find yourself 10 years from now because i can tell you this i never thought it would be this for me i know there are jobs now that are available and thriving that weren't a thing like 10 years ago and it's so fun to watch and to think like, oh, well, I wonder what the next 10 years will bring. But a lot of us first gen Latinas are, um, we're not only learning how to navigate a world that is new to us, but we're also trying to teach and educate our parents and the generation before us to like, understand that the mindsets and the ways of thinking that they grew up with were serving them for that period of time, but they're so different for our generation and not just our generation, but our generation in the U.S. So how have those conversations been for you when you're trying to help your parents understand like, okay, well, this is the next step and it's going to look differently. Or like, I'm not looking for that simple, easy life. Um, how do you explain like what you do through social media? Um, yeah. How do you, how do you have those conversations with your, your family? No, of course. And I really appreciate you asking this and I'm going to give you a hundred percent real because I feel like it's me just sharing my experience as a first gen Latina is more realistic than like, you know, the cookie cutter answer, but it's, it's been a challenge. It's a learning process for all of us, including myself, you know, because at the same time, I don't want to let all like the good traditions that I love for my culture die away just because we're in the U S. So it's like a, it's a day by day, month by month process, but to be a hundred percent transparent, when I started social media. So I was making the transition because I, I put a pause on my master's for a bunch of family stuff. So I had to move up to Modesto, but I didn't want to give up on school. So, but the university I was going at, they didn't have a lot of master's options. So I ended up picking up the teaching credential because I was like, well, I'm good at teaching. Let me do this for a little while. And then it'll help with my overall GPA when I apply to a PhD type of stuff. Anyways, and so when I was up there in Modesto, moved away from home, I was gone for about four years. Like, yes, I was gone in Santa Barbara when I was in Santa Barbara. But the difference was what was Santa Barbara was like a lot closer. And then during that time, my mindset was more like really pleasing everybody type of thing. You know, all my loved ones, cosas así. But with all the hardships that happened, during that time frame that I was in my master's and transitioning to a teaching credential, so many things happened where it just like it opened my eyes enough. So I was 25 at the time. It opened my eyes enough to be like, OK, you can still love and think about them and answer the phone, but just do it less, even if you feel like a villain. OK, just do it less for yourself. So then that's what I did. And being now six hours away definitely helped do that a lot more which again, I never in a million years thought I'd be in a position like that. So being alone for so long and yeah, I had school to keep me busy. Yes, I was working, but I still was just like, what can I do with my time? Because it's like, we're also in a pandemic, by the way. And it's like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Well, again, I guess I'll start that podcast because of all these different initiatives and courses I see that I talked about in the beginning. So I started doing the podcast and then one, then my family, they were following me and things like that. Wasn't a big deal or anything. And it was actually pretty cute, you know, but I know during that time they just thought, oh, it's just a little hobby that'll like 
it'll have its the the doors will close eventually you know because sometimes people just need that creative outlet like not everything has to turn into a full-time business you know but sometimes people again need that creative outlet but then one thing led to another and I'm just like making the podcast doing the social media in school cosas así and I my business my social media would have never been able to grow the way it did if I didn't leave my parents' house, because one, a lot of the distractions, they're not like horrible distractions, but it's like, again, dropping everything to go do this and that. And then two, it just like, I didn't know I was doing this for myself, but being away helped me learn how to like advocate for myself, not just like at home, but also like in the career, y cosas así. So then when I was getting ready to move back with my home with my parents, I was just like, okay, my parents, I don't know how I'm going to explain to them that I'm going to pursue social media full time. But one thing I do know about my parents, even though I'm figuring out the right terminology to tell them about this, is that my whole life, they'd always say actions over words. That's their biggest thing. It's like, mm -hmm. I, especially because I talk a lot. So I think that's why they would tell me that a lot because I talk a lot. So they'll be like, yeah, that's nice, Estrella, but like, what are you getting out of it? What's the outcome? Are you making something out of this? And because even though I was like learning to be more independent and even though I was so far away from them, one of the few things that did stick in my mind, even though I wasn't like seeing them so frequently as before, was them like, what is this? Like, what, what are you going to show us? We only like actions. We only like actions. So in my head, I'm like, okay, so actions from what I know about my parents is seeing that others believe in this work so how are others going to believe in this work if they feel validated if they feel a community so in order to help my people i need to also help my parents in their way see and understand what i'm doing and how impactful it is so this was never my intention but when i moved back home i had already so with all my social media platforms combined i have about 90k of a following like with all of them combined and with the tedx talk it, if it wasn't for that TEDx talk and my following, I feel like the conversations could have gone a different way. And it's not easy. Like I, I did lovingly sacrifice a lot to be here, but I also wouldn't have changed it in any other way because it's like this work also saved me. You know, it helped me like learn more about myself, even though I still had so much to do. And it also helped me not feel so alone when I felt alone so much. And then when I officially moved back home, well, first of all, I told my parents, okay, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And they're like, what's that? Which like, it makes me laugh because if you really think about it, most of our immigrant parents have always been entrepreneurs. They just like, they do it like really on the side. It's just like for that extra money, like the little things, you know? And then I was just like, okay, so how can I explain this? And I was like, okay, that podcast, da, da, da. And then finally, I was just like, okay, so I work on social media. So think of an influencer that is trying to do more than like influence with commercials. And they're like, okay. And now we're like, I think we're three months into me being full-time entrepreneur at the house. They're more like, they 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 just let me be they still don't get it but they they don't disturb me when i'm working and that's the best thing i can ask for because like i know for them being on the computer it can look like games but because they've seen my progress they're like okay so yeah i guess the best way i could say it is just like just keep doing you the end result it's not easy but the end result will be all that they need to be like okay I think it's super relatable to have parents, well, to be doing something for so long and then parents still don't actually like 100% get what you're doing. And um, yeah, I'm sure that many, many people can relate. How was the experience of doing a TEDx talk? And like, did you get the opportunity uh, through someone else or did you seek that opportunity out? No, of course. I appreciate this question. So I actually didn't apply to this. I what how it ended up happening. So again, that's why I'm a I'm a true believer of just like 
do what calls you and everything else that's meant for you will come. And obviously the things that aren't meant for you, you don't want them anyways. They're going to get you off your track. But no, I was, so this was last summer. I was 26, right? No, I'm 28. So I was 27. Okay, cool. So it was last summer. I was 27 and I was approached. I was approached by, I thought it was a scam. I'm not going to lie at first until I saw the letter. So bear with me. I should have checked the email address, but whatever. Okay. So I was approached by TEDx organizers because like, there's like all these logistics with hosting a TEDx talk that I didn't even know, but essentially there's people that can get, they can apply. And if they get everything they need, they can earn the license to be a TEDx organizer and they can host their own TEDx events. So these TEDx organizers, they came across my social media and they reached out via email and they introduced themselves, da, da, da. And then they were like, we really, really love your work. Have you ever thought of doing a TEDx talk? And in my brain, I was like, yes, because I listened to those all through college, like TED Talks, TEDx Talks. Those were my podcasts because I didn't know podcasts were a thing until grad school. And then I was just like, oh, and like it just sounded too good to be true. And then I jumped on a meeting. One thing led to another. And then once they dealt with all their logistics, not dealt in a bad way, it's just like it was a lot, you know, where they got the location, they did this and that. They sent me an acceptance letter, like, hey, like not an acceptance, an invitation letter that we want you here. And that TEDx talk just meant even more to me because, well, one, not only because of like everything at Cafecito, but number two is just like I was actually seen, I was actually discovered by people that love what I'm doing for my community. They want to see good things for people of color, for first gen. And ah, that's why like prepping for that TEDx talk was probably one of the hardest things I had ever done because I was also applying to PhD programs at the time. And everybody knows this, or if you don't, it's okay. I'm just like, I, I'm an academic nerd sometimes, but anyways, no, even applying to a PhD program takes a village. So I had my little village for my PhD. Then I had my village for my TEDx talk, but it was funny because while I was prepping for my TEDx talk, my village was myself and my older sister, but that was like more than enough, you know, because nobody knows any of this. We're like, okay. So it was a lot like, and then when it was all over, I look back and I'm like, how the heck did I put myself through all of that mentally? Like, I mean, it was good because I was doing good things, applying to PhD programs, doing a TEDx talk, but it was so like, it was so mentally like, like it was, a, it's, it was like a whirlwind. I don't want to say it was good. I want to say it was bad, but it really tested me a lot emotionally and what I can handle, you know? And I'm like, I'm definitely taking it a lot easier. I'll tell you that. But yeah, so I hope that answered the question. Yeah. How did you, during all of these like transitions and hard times, did you find the time to like ground yourself Uh, or did you, or like, what was that, that process? Is there like a specific thing that you've gone back to every time to kind of get you back into the right headspace? No, of course. And thank you for asking that question. Uh, I Like I said, one thing I do wish I could have done differently, but it's just, it was just such a hard different time because it's like, because I was navigating, okay, you need to be a bad, like boss, all that good stuff, a baddie for this TED Talk. But you also, you're writing your PhD apps and statement of intent, asking for these letters, meeting with faculty. So you need to like, be a boss, but still be humble about it because you need them to like, let you in type of thing. So it was probably one of the hardest things I ever did for myself mentally. So I'm not going to lie. It took me like two months to recover mentally after the Ted talk and after um, the announcements with the apps, you know? So I was just with my PhD apps, but anyways, prior to that, what really helped me stay grounded during that heavy time of I'm going to say November to January because it was nonstop then, like very nonstop. Just literally, I like to drive in my car like to nowhere for like 30 minutes and I I blast music. It's just so nice. And I'm just like, especially back then when I was living in Modesto, because it's a lot of country out there. 
So there are certain paths where there's no stoplight. So it's just like a straight drive. And there's only like maybe four stoplights like every 10 minutes. So you're just like, whoo, whoo. And I'm not talking about like in the city. It's like the outskirts of like that county. So I would do that. And then afterwards, like I would just like park and I would talk to like Diosito and like ask him like, you know, and I would just think a lot about my life. I would think a lot about like my loved ones that are still here that aren't here anymore. And I would like to say, like, even if you don't pray, meditating, as long as you are being and connected with you and whatever brings you peace, that's the best thing I feel you can do for yourself when you're going through such heavy transitions that are not only good for your life, but also good for your career. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing. I know that like that time period is so chaotic, like in general, because it's like the holidays and we are just getting into Q4. So are there any big goals that you have this year? So as many of you know, I have been in conversations about writing a book. I've been doing the networking to get the contacts of agents and I have this amazing book mentor, shout out to Ashley, also slash biz mentor. So not only am I working on that, but I have officially launched my college and post-grad coaching. I've always had it on the side, but I've never have had it full time like I'm doing right now, which I'm just so grateful. Not like I'm grateful for not only the life that I've built for myself right now, even though I'm still figuring it out, but also for all of you that have helped me get into this position where I can be a support to students, to postgrads, whether it's through managing the different challenges we had gone through with like limiting beliefs, academic probation, knowledge of graduate school, cosas así. And also for the postgrads where it's just like, okay, I graduated, now what? And it's like, okay, now what? And I'm still making podcast episodes. So with my podcast, I always want to give back to the next generation or give forward to the next generation. So what advice or encouragement would you have for those who are trying to decide if they want to continue with their higher education? No, of course. And 100% transparent is literally what I just told myself. Like, if you can take a gap year. Maybe if you only need gap months. The reason why I feel like I needed a gap year is because I'm somebody where first I'm in denial. So I'm in, in denial about a bunch of stuff for at least three months. I know that sounds bad, but bear with me. And then for me, reality kicks in. I'm like, okay, now I can fully analyze my options with a clear mind. But if you're not like that, if you process things sooner then that gap, six months may be enough for you. So if I could just like put it all together is like, make sure you give yourself intentional breaks. I know it can feel very challenging because we want to do so much, not just for ourselves, not just for our families, but also for the future generations, whatever that may look like with cycle breaking, with career growth, with growing generational wealth, toda esa cosa. But it's like those intentional breaks are so important, very, very important. And if there's any way that you can spend time with like being on your own, whether you move away for school or whether you study abroad or you can actually move out, do that for yourself too. Like it's really hard, but it's good because it's like you can see what you're like fully capable of. And then look at me. I still ended up moving back home with my parents, but it's okay, you know? Yeah, man, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm so thankful for this time with you. For anyone who wants to connect with you, where's the best place that they can find you? No, of course. So as always, feel free to subscribe and share Cafecito con Estrellita on any platform that you use to listen to your podcast. She's not on YouTube yet, but just give me some patience with that. And then on Instagram, TikTok, Cafecito con Estrellita, and then my website. If you go straight to cafecitoconestrellita.com, you'll find everything there. 
Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I am so thankful for your time and you like are just so relatable. Like I said, I feel like I know you because I've been listening to your podcast and you are like the real deal. So thank you so much. And I hope that we can meet in person soon. I agree a hundred percent. And thank you again for opening the space for me. I really, really appreciate it. All right. Well, let's plan a time for me to either come to your side of the country or you to come to the Midwest and we'll meet in person. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. Bye. Oh my goodness. Estrella is so kind and I'm so grateful to her sharing her story. Definitely give her a follow and share her info with a young adult in your life that's on their education journey. For more information on Estrella and to see press features, articles, etc., go to cafecitoconestrellita.com. Okay, amigos, thank you so much for listening. There'll be a new episode every Tuesday, so after you listen, feel free to take a screenshot, post on Instagram, and tag at Elevating La Cultura, or send me a DM. You can also comment on this YouTube video if you're watching online. I always like to hear from people and how they resonate with the stories that I share. So leave a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get more ears listening to these stories and we can continue elevating La Cultura. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening. Y nos vemos next week. Adios.